Good morning. Uh, before we get started, a couple of brief announcements. We have a uh, special guest, uh, Professor Graham Lair, who is uh, here visiting, who is setting up the meeting next year, uh, almost to the date, will be the hosts of the surgical section of the Royal Society of Medicine for a three-day uh, visit and meeting where some of uh, we will hear some of their presentations and some of our faculty and residents will be giving presentations to them. So this will be an opportunity for uh, uh, many of you to uh, uh, see and meet some of the uh, leaders of the uh, Royal Society of Medicine and Royal College of Surgeons who will be here. Um, Today we're going to hear a uh, special presentation by uh, Dr. Jeff Cohn from the uh, uh, outgoing uh, senior uh, advanced GI and laparoscopic fellow on the GI division who will be presenting his work on the outcomes of uh, research and the research of outcomes. Dr. Cohn. Thank you, Dr. Meyer and all others for um, the opportunity to present here. Um, this is a topic that uh, I've sort of fallen into over the year. We've had a fair few research projects going on in the division, um, and we sort of stumbled across this um, idea of outcomes research. Um, and we've seemed to have got a fair good benefit from it and some very good quality research coming out of it. Um, and I find it a very interesting area and a, a very good area that, that is accessible uh, to people without large sort of funding budgets and without large research departments to get some very good uh, publications and some very good um, data from. So I thought I might share that with you today. Um, speaking about the outcomes of research and the research of outcomes. The National Library of Medicine um, defines outcomes research as research that ev evaluates the impact of healthcare on the health outcomes of patients and populations. Uh, the outcomes research emphasizes disease oriented oriented evaluations of care delivered in general real world settings and a wide range of outcomes including mortality, morbidity and functional status are examined. That comment about real world outcomes is very important. A lot of the papers that you read and a lot of the publications that are in the literature are really are from very highly specialized services and units around the world um, with a very highly select patient population uh, and this uh, this data that comes from that may not be that relevant and that applicable to uh, other settings and other, uh, other locales around the world. The wide range of outcomes are very important as well. Uh, initially, um, most studies uh, into various disease and uh, procedure processes uh, look at uh, mortality rates, perhaps a, a very select set of morbidities. And normally when the, the topic and the field matures, people start looking at length of stays and then finally cost benefits and the like. Um, but outcomes research really can tackle most of these at the, at the same time because of the great databases that are uh, out there. So the what, why and how of uh, outcomes research. Um, over the last sort of 10, 15 years with the advent of um, uh, bigger uh, databases, more nationalized and coordinated databases, as well as better computing systems and, um, and more accessible statistical techniques, these administrative databases have grown and have merged and have become a very good source of, uh, of information for us. They're easily accessible um, to everybody, again, without the need for backup of a large lab or big NIH funding or the like. Um, and, and it really does have very high quality data that's used for, uh, for defining public policy um, and for really guiding the whole surgical community. The use of administrative databases really allows projects to come to fruition much quicker. Uh, there's not the large prolonged uh, data collection period or, or patient recruitment uh, phase that most studies would require um, because the data's already been collected by other sources and are just compiled in a uniform manner uh, for, for us to analyze. Major funding sources really are not required for this, uh, at least not on the individual level, though there's a large support uh, behind this by many, for example, government organisations both here and abroad. There are many large administrative databases out there, and I'm just going to touch on a few today before I focus on, on, on our research using the nationwide inpatient sample. One of the largest databases around is the, um, the NHANES database from the Centers for Disease Control. Um, and it looks at a, a wide variety of health uh, outcomes, survey and examination findings, focusing on environmental, nutrition, 
um, infectious disease type um, uh, problems. The SEER database has been presented at this meeting before, um, and it's one of the most extensive and, um, and largest administrative databases with regards to cancer statistics in the world, and it's, it's been used uh, to a very good extent, and I'll speak more about that. There are other local databases, such as the North Carolina State Employees Health Plan. Um, some of the benefits of the local data is it's easier to follow patients through the program and, and, and get some extra information that some of the other databases don't have, databases don't have when they become de-identified. Um, and they also include uh, other accessory data, such as the pharmacy database of the, of the state health plan. Um, and of course, the nationwide inpatient sample, um, which has been the focus of our research over much of the last six months. Looking first at the NHANGE database, this is a, a very large database of non-institutionalized United States residents. Uh, it's weighted about one in 50,000, which means it's a, a stratified sample down to the level of an individual house, household where every single survey respondent is meant to represent uh, a, a stratified sample of 50,000 uh, uh, citizens of the general population. They use a whole lot of fancy statistical tests to make sure that these people are representative um, and it allows some very uh, broad sweeping uh, recommendations and guidelines to be generated. Then Haynes uses both direct interview and examination in mobile testing units. Um, and it's actually free. It's provided by the government. And the data is free and accessible to all. Um, so it's a very good source uh, of information to perhaps start a, a, an important project. Some of the things they look for in interview, uh, as we said before, are um, infectious disease type um, questions, uh, mental health issues, nutritional issues, um, physical examination really has a whole uh, battery of uh, lab tests and x-rays and urine analysis and um, body mass indices and, and uh, waist to hip circumferences and the like. It actually gives a very, very broad assessment of the patients that it's, been, um, that, that it's targeting. Some very important findings have been generated from the NHANES. Um, that have been used both here and around the world, such as the pediatric growth charts that we all use in pediatric uh, medicine and surgery have been directly generated from data supplied by the NHANES. Um, uh, programs such as the vitamin and mineral fortification of food, foodstuffs and food products such as iron and folate supplementation, again, have been a direct result of studies uh, done on the epidemiological data of the NHANES database. Um, Public policy to decrease the production of lead-containing products in gasoline and household paints, again, is from Anne Haynes. And most of the reporting on the current state of the obesity epidemic um, that is affecting um, most of the Western world has come directly from the Anne Haynes. So these are very wide-ranging public policy programs that have been done on a minimal budget um, with some very good data and some very important findings. This is just a selection of about 10 slides that come from the NHANES that uh, show some of the lab tests that are, that are done on this program. So you can see that they test for just about everything. Anything you would like to study is probably being collected um, and is available for you to get some really good, good quality research. The SEER database um, is the uh, cancer database. It's free as well. More than 5 million tumours have been registered on the database from 1973 to 2006. Um, a wide variety of patient data elements have been collected, including patient demographics, demographics, ethnicity and race, um, just about everything surrounding the diagnosis, the histology, the stage and the grade of the tumour, um, as well as uh, clinical and biological behaviour markers, treatments and extensive treatments with uh, extent of lymphadenectomy, for example, extent of um, radiotherapy, um, different types of chemotherapy, and of course, um, tracking of death rates. This is a wonderful database, again, that's free to everybody, and um, has come out with, again, some very important papers based on the freely available data. There's some surveillance um, publications that have come out. For example, it was first reported from SEER database of the rising incidence of esophagogastric adenocarcinoma uh, in the world, but also, of course, in this country, uh, and an association of the risk of that with um, being increased with smoking. The breast cancer risk assessment tool that's used very frequently in most breast surgical clinics around the country is a direct finding um, and a direct um, publication from the SEER database. 
epidemiological questions have been answered, such as the protection offered by non-steroidals for colorectal cancer, uh, again, straight from the CIRA database. Um, and lots of outcomes research has uh, arisen as well, such as um, the combination of the CIRA Medicare database allowing very detailed cost analysis of both um, diagnosis and procedure pathways, um, as well as, for example, um, close evaluation of second cancer, such as breast cancer post radiotherapy for Hodgkin's disease, uh, leukemias after platinum-based chemotherapies and the like. The North, uh, North Carolina State Employees Health Plan is another one of the ones I'll briefly mention. Um, this is a local database that we're just really starting to become familiar with and I think offers a very good opportunity for us at this hospital to generate some very inf interesting information. This is an expensive database, costing, costing approximately $2,000 per year for the data. Uh, it's not free. Uh, it does allow continued tracking of the patients because the patients are, are what's called re-identified. They're not able to be uh, tracked in that they're de-identified, but then they come back with a number that continues across, uh, across the years. So one can still follow patients and follow their outcomes. Um, and see how they're doing, even though one can't actually uh, identify a particular patient in a population. Um, most interesting to us in the division uh, is that pharmacy data are also included in this. So we can test some of our hypotheses with regards to proton pump inhibitions and some of the side effects of that um, as compared to, say, Nissen fund application, which is one of our areas of interest under the leadership of Dr. Farrell. Um, there are many state databases, um, but very few surgical papers have been generated from this. It's a great opportunity um, for us here. Um, about the only surgical paper I could see from any of the state's uh, health plan databases was from Louisiana, where they really just evaluated the cost of bariatric surgery after linking with Medicare data. And that, again, was one of the landmark papers in the area, um, and, and it's been very interesting. The data set that we use most uh, is a nationwide inpatient sample. We've um, become quite familiar with it. It's giving us um, a lot of very interesting information. Um, in the space of about three months, it's already generated about five papers in, in um, core journals with high impact factor. So it's very accepted data. It's a, an accepted methodology, um, and, it's, and it's very interesting. It's very inexpensive access to the NIS. As a student or a postdoc, um, you can access it for $20 a year. Um, if um, you're on faculty, it costs $200 a year. You just need to find a student who is willing to, to join you. Um, on a very brief search of PubMed, at least 500 publications have come out um, referencing the NIS, and over 200 of these have been in core AIM journals, um, most of them high impact factor because of the, the significance of the data set and the, and the sheer, sheer volume of the data set. This is the largest all-payer uh, all payer inpatient care database in the United States. Um, for example, in 2006, it provided uh, every discharge uh, or data about every discharge from over 1,000 hospitals in 38 states, um, giving nearly 8 million hospital stays per year, um, which are followed. Um, and this, again, goes through the same stratification and um, sampling measures as the other databases, and this can be extrapolated to approximately 40 million hospital stays per year. So the, sh the sheer size of these databases uh, are, are unbelievable, and that's what gives the high quality data. Um, the NIS only looks at inpatients. Um, it only looks at non-federal patients, so patients who are not in the VA or the military systems or Indian health systems. It only looks at short-term hospitals and institutions, um, excluding people in long-term care, psychiatric hospitals, prison hospitals, etc. Um, and it does look at both general and specialty hospitals. And one of the most important things when designing projects with these, um, these administrative databases is to work out the limitations and work out exactly which population you're capturing. So it's very important to go through exactly where the discharge data is coming from um, and who's excluded before you can come up with reasonable results. Where does the NIS data come from? It comes from state-based billing data. Um, it's a partnership between state data organisations um, and um, this government organisation called AHRQ. It does have limitations, as do all of them. Um, because the patients have not been re-identified, patients can, cannot be tracked as soon as they leave the hospital. Um, not all states are represented. As you can see, only 38 states were represented in 2006, which is the most recent uh, data collection year. Um, and, of course, it relies on the correct coding. Somebody has to get the codes in correctly. 
um, from our hospital, it comes from the coding department. It's not from PNA, which is a CPT code based um, coding system. It's actually from the hospital itself, which uses uh, ICD-9 codes or ICD-9 uh, clinical modification codes. Um, and they get submitted to a state organization, which then um, forwards them on to AHRQ um, for inclusion in the data set. These are the data elements that are included in, in the NIS, and you can see they're very broad ranging and can be uh, used and manipulated to give some very good information. All the normal demographic data is in there. Um, the hospital location is in there, and that lends itself to very good analyses of, um, of hospital annual case volume versus outcomes uh, measurements. So that's um, very topical at the moment, especially in certain areas of general surgery. Um, it has a lot of economic data, such as median incomes in the zip code of the patient, um, which again has been used for, uh, to drive policy, uh, especially in Washington. Um, and it, um, it records up to 15 diagnoses codes and 15 procedure codes, and can actually tell the order in which the procedures were performed. Um, so one can determine if these were complications of the procedure or performed on admission. Our outcomes research, um, will be presented now and why I'm presenting it is really to demonstrate the possibilities of these uh, of these data sets uh, to illustrate some of the limitations and perhaps show how easy it is to, to really get some very good papers from this. The first paper we looked at or the first um, project we did was to evaluate the recent trends in bariatric surgery case volume. Um, as, as you know one of our division's um, roles is to provide bariatric surgery to this hospital um, and it's quite a political area at the moment with the establishment of Centre of Excellence programs, um, mostly driven um, by the uh, perception of the increasing demand for bariatric surgery in this country. Um, this paper that we, that we published really describes some of the limitations uh, of the data set as it applies to the accuracy of the coding. Um, and despite some of the problems, uh, this also highlights the strength of the data and the widespread utilisation and uptake of the recommendations that can be generated. In introduction, um, certain organisations such as the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery have um, repeatedly um, uh, reported an exponentially increasing requirement and, uh, and um, performance of bariatric operations in the country. And that's been quoted at over 700 hits on PubMed and, and, and Google, um, but never actually published in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, so it's out there, that's what everybody thinks um, professional organisations and third party payers um, have really taken this to heart very rapidly and designed centre of excellence programs to guide training um, and, um, and to supervise uh, quality of care. Healthcare systems and device manufacturers have uh, expanded their capacity based on this widespread belief um, and many surgeons um, are pursuing a career solely in bariatric surgery or like myself um, uh, combining it with a minimally invasive practice. <clears throat> However, no uniform recording system actually exists for, for bariatric surgery. It's very difficult to get a case volume estimate. Um, so the aim of our paper was to accurately report national trends in the area. We queried the nationwide inpatient sample for operations from 1998 to 2006, uh, remembering, of course, that we had to code um, for the procedures based on the ICD-9 uh, clinical modification codes. We used various search strategies, um, and I'll explain that a bit. There are specific codes for bariatric surgery that we search for. Some of these only came into uh, sort of evolution in around about 2004 when the whole field kicked off a little bit quicker. So before 2004, any operation that was performed might not have been captured at all. Um, and indeed, uh, some procedures that were not done for uh, a primarily weight loss uh, indication might have been captured incorrectly. There are certain organisations like the Leapfrog organisation, which is a, um, a group driven by organisations which buy healthcare and aim to promote cost containment and improve quality in provision of healthcare. They set their own criteria, um, and based on their criteria, they, uh, they recommend case volume um, requirements, um, which has been interpreted to sort of be a surrogate for centre of excellence status. Um, and some people are using leapfrog criteria for uh, determination of funding and remuneration. Um, 
the UHC, the University Health System Consortium criteria is an alliance of over 100 academic medical centres and only over 130 uh, teaching hospitals that again come up with their own search criteria and their own guidelines based on what they think should be done um, based on the number of operations being done. And there's various groups um, such as a, a big one out of Chicago and copied by the Stanford group um, and some criteria provided by ourselves over here to try and estimate what's actually going on. <clears throat> um, not going to go through this slide other than to say that it shows the complexity of trying to pick up a bariatric case over the time zone, over, over the time frame. Um, you can see that, for example, the leapfrog criteria at the top of the list um, uses uh, in excess of 20 uh, codes to try and pick up um, bariatric operations. This is what's submitted as billing data from our hospital billing system. Um, and for example, things that are uh, gastroenterostomy which is performed for palliation of pancreatic cancer, for example, um, that is very frequently coded as a gastric bypass um, because somebody has written down in the operative note that it was a, a palliative gastric bypass. Um, and certain of the coding strategies um, pick that up, um, such as the leapfrog and UHC criteria. Despite this, these are widely published with over 100 articles talking about um, uh, bariatric case volume based on these flawed data. So we've, we've modified it and worked out ways of improving it. We've reported the differences between the different coding systems. The ASMBS survey data is uh, like, like they publicise the rapidly increasing um, case volume, but it really seems to have peaked in 2003, 2004 by whatever coding criteria one uses. Um, and quite clearly seems to be going down. There are some limitations to this. This is uh, inpatient data only, so certain of the newer procedures like laparoscopic adjustable gastric band may not be um, picked up, but indeed we coded separately for that using manufacturer um, and commercially um, provided data, and it seems that the trends are, uh, are true. Um, so the conclusions we had from this is the different search criteria can give vastly different results. Um, some things are constant in that bariatric surgery caseloads are definitely decreasing and probably have been for a few years already. Anecdote and self-reporting is, in, is inadequate. Policy decisions should be based on standardised and verifiable data. Um, and what's very interesting to me is that this decrease seemed to occur at the time of institution of centres of excellence. This is something that's been driven both here and around the world um, in various different surgical specialties. And it is possible that by limiting the number of centres that can perform such operations, this may limit access to um, patients um, and uh, access patients to their care. Um, so there are some negative connotations to uh, the, these policies, and they really need to be, therefore, based on some very accurate data. Um, that was one of the major limitations uh, I think I highlighted with regards to the coding problems of these, uh, of these data sets. The next thing we looked at um, was the, how hospital case volume and other influences can affect outcome in bariatric surgery to try and justify the current paradigm. Um, we know that some of the major strengths of this uh, outcomes research uh, is that nationwide trends can be detected and reported, um, and, and this is particularly applicable to major volume outcome relationships. Due to the sheer size of the database, infrequent outcomes and infrequent complications can be evaluated as well and reported that otherwise could not be done in, in, in smaller case series. The background to this is that there are many programs based on the perceived importance of bariatric surgery that are coming up with curricular guidelines and program accreditation algorithms, um, such as SAGES, the Fellowship Council, um, and others. And these have been rapidly uh, accepted and adopted as well by various professional organisations such as the ASMBS and the American College um, to designate cer certain programs as uh, centres of excellence. Um, and this in turn has rapidly been embraced by insurance and malpractice providers and linked to remuneration. However, there's remarkably little evidence to support these initiatives, especially in the area of bariatric surgery. Um, it has been shown uh, for many years in um, some very good research that there's a strong correlation between volume and outcome for pancreatectomy, liver resection, coronary artery bypass grafting, and other operations, um, but not really so for bariatric surgery. Early on, uh, early in the uh, development of the specialty, uh, there were some reports um, coming out of California 
um, that decided on an arbitrary threshold of 100 cases uh, of any type of bariatric operation being the threshold between low and high volume centres. Um, they published mortality data on, on uh, this arbitrary um, uh, distinction. They reported very few other complications, yet this still led very rapidly to widespread adoption. Um, and even, even today, the Centre of Excellence use either 100 or 125 as the cutoff between high and low volume centres, and this was initially based on an arbitrary um, uh, designation by certain, uh, certain authors. So our hypothesis was that it really does exist a case volume outcome relationship in this area. The current program design and implementation is safe for patients and that these organisations are getting their program accreditation algorithms correct um, and that the Centre of Excellence designation does in fact improve outcomes as people believe it does. So again, we use the nationwide inpatient sample. We obtain data on which institutions offer uh, training programs from the website of the Fellowship Council, which is the main area, sorry, the main player in the area. Um, we determine which hospitals offer general surgical residencies from the AMA and the ACGME uh, web pages, um, and we determined which hospitals offered center or, or had center of excellence status after undergoing the rigorous um, sort of accreditation procedures of both the ASMBS and the ACS. We used the same criteria that we had previously published, um, which um, we thought probably the most conservative was that reported by the University of Chicago. Um, and this is important to us in that it shows the continuity between our projects and the, uh, one of the other benefits of, of setting up a very good search strategy from these large databases is they can continue to churn out data um, for different areas for a long time. We risk adjusted our outcome, which is one of the big sort of problems in, uh, in outcomes research is getting an appropriate risk adjustment um, between institutions. We use the thing called the Charlson Index, which is a validated um, comorbidity score that's been validated in both medical patients, in surgical patients, and now also in trauma patients um, from some work done at this hospital. Um, and this is a validated way of estimating uh, mortality and predicting outcomes um, from administrative data sets. If any of the NIS's 15 diagnos diagnoses codes included any of the above, they were included, and we specifically um, we specifically analysed uh, these outcomes. The Charleston Index is made up of a scoring system um, looking uh, at these uh, comorbidities. Um, the DO modification that we use is one of the more, more widespread uh, as applied to surgical patients. Comes up with a total of 33, um, and the higher the number, the sicker the patient is. And that's been validated both uh, with our own pilot data, but also in, in multiple studies to suggest that the higher the Charleston score, the higher the expected um, mortality rate of an in-hospital stay. We analysed our data using standard statistical techniques, uh, using the SAS uh, statistical program, uh, much to the IT department's concern at this hospital, um, it uses massive computing power um, and we've cooked two hard drives and one computer so far, <laughs> um, but uh, we've got some good results. We use what's called logistic regression modelling using um, a standard method of generalised estimating equations. Um, different to most of the reports in the literature, we actually use a thing called a binomial distribution uh, of our data, or assumed binomial distribution, um, which on speaking with many statisticians is the right way to go. Uh, and remarkably, most of the papers, even in the large journals, um, ha have used what's quite clearly the wrong uh, logistic regression models. Um, also, we used repeated measure analyses where we assume that patients done in the same hospital will have similar outcomes and definitely more similar than patients done in different hospitals, um, which makes sense, we think, because the same surgeons work in the one place. Um, and again, this is different to most other uh, reports. Uh, we appropriately applied the NIS weighting uh, to our um, methodology. Um, as you remember, it's sort of a 20% sample, so we upsized most by about um, a, a factor of five. And we quite clearly explained our methodology in all our publications, which again is a major flaw in most of the publications in the area. Um, again, leading great opportunity for any of us 
um, to come out with um, more statistically rigorous uh, analyses. And we used the normal p-values to determine significance. This showed us um, that there were 102,000 unweighted bariatric procedures done in the study period, which uh, upsizes to nearly 500,000 for our uh, study group. Um, the majority early on were done in hospitals with low case volume, um, but over the study period more were done in high volume centres as expected. Um, what's interesting is that the uh, overall mortality rate for all uh, bariatric operations decreased dramatically over the study period um, from 0.66 to 0.13% in 2006. And this was associated with an actual uh, significant increase in the comorbidity scores. So these patients were sicker and we were still getting better outcomes. And this is the first time this has been reported. Then we did some, um, some uh, what we thought quite clever logistical regression analysis, looking at the incremental effect of every single uh, bariatric case on outcomes. So we did this logistical regression modeling um, and we determined that a single increase in bariatric case volume per year has the following effect on these uh, outcomes. So remembering that an odds ratio of one means no difference and an odds ratio of below one shows an improvement. Every single bariatric case volume would be expected to decrease the expected death rate uh, in, a, in a certain hospital to a significant degree. And this is probably one of the more rigorous and most striking findings uh, that's ever been published in the area of case volume research in bariatrics, um, showing that nearly every single uh, examined outcome improved with case volume. We also looked at the effect, uh, the independent effect of a fellowship program um, run by um, the Fellowship Council on our comorbidities, adjusting for or controlling for both the improvements in mortality over the years, um, as well as uh, controlling for Charleston comorbidity scores and the, um, the evident case volume benefits. And we found that certain things got better, such as splenectomies and bacterial pneumonias, and we weren't quite sure why we thought about that. We thought perhaps um, services that are specifically designed uh, to do this type of operation, and especially now that they're becoming more laparoscopic, perhaps the skills of the people doing them in the more laparoscopic er era uh, are, are better, and perhaps the, the technical skills uh, and the avoidance of inadvertent splenic injury, for example, are, are therefore decreased. And we weren't sure about that, but it's actually been borne out in some other studies we've done, looking at esophagectomies, um, intra-abdominal operations, and liver operations that I'll show soon. Um, from uh, venous thrombosis was significantly increased. And this is possibly due to the longer time it takes for um, a fellow or a resident to do the operation compared with uh, an experienced attending. Again, we thought that probably wouldn't mean much, but that's been reproduced um, quite markedly over the examination of various other operations as well. Then we looked at the surgical residency program. So these are hospitals that have a general surgical residency. Um, and we looked at these outcomes. And again, splenectomy, bacterial pneumonia, and respiratory uh, complications, other respiratory complications were decreased. Um, but certain things were increased. Again, venous thrombosis or thromboembolism, um, myocardial infarction, and cardiac complications. Again, maybe the length of time of the operation uh, caused this, perhaps. Uh, hospitals that have general surgical residencies also always have anaesthetic or anesthesiology residencies, perhaps leading to longer anesthesia time and maybe some of the others. It is possible that uh, this was just picked up because of increased diagnosis of these problems. Um, these are some of the limitations of the database that I wanted to show, but it's a very interesting finding that it's not yet been reported or has not, had not previously been reported. And I think it does mandate further examination of the safety um, of our training programs that really has not been looked at despite the sort of imposition from outside organisations on, on training before accreditation. We did look at the independent effect of Centre of Excellence um, designation. So after adjusting for case volume, remembering the case volume is a major component of Centre of Excellence, um, there are other components such as having a good psychological program, a good uh, nutrition component, adjusting the facilities of the hospital to better uh, accept bariatric patients. Um, looking at the ASMBS, the only independent effect um, of the actual designation of Centre of Excellence was on the respiratory complications. 
Um, I'm not sure why that was, but it was very interesting that none of the other things changed. Um, and again, for the American College, um, total number of complications, but uh, also respiratory complications were mildly um, uh, significantly affected in both directions. So our conclusions from this paper were that for the first time the volume outcome relationships of bariatric surgery had been proved without artificially categorising hospitals to case volume groups. Um, the centre of excellence designation had been validated, though there's minimal independent effect um, of the uh, criteria for centre of excellence other than case volume. Um, fellowship training is safe in bariatric surgery. Um, and there are concerns about hospitals that offer surgical residencies in some of the outcomes of bariatric surgery, um, uh, whether or not that's attributable to the program itself or other extraneous issues is yet to be determined, but definitely warrants further urgent investigation. So the current paradigm of assuming improved results based on volume and specialised training is justified, and we aim to further investigate the other effects in, in future papers. As a final paper to present, um, really to highlight the application of uh, a modular um, search strategy and statistical analysis um, that can really be used with minimal effort to gener generate maximum broad ranging results across various um, uh, disease and procedure groups. Uh, we reported our trends in esophageal surgery. This is in process and, and it's going to be presented next week. Um, to try and determine if esophageal surgery outcomes are as good as we believe and what the effect of training in the current era are on uh, esophagectomies. The background to this is that esophageal cancer is increasing at uh, greater than 2% per year, making it one of the fastest growing uh, problems in this community. It's currently ranked seventh among the highest causes of death. Um, esophagectomy is a high risk, low volume operation and therefore has been embraced as warranting of uh, regionalization of care. Um, using volume as a surrogate for quality. Um, regionalization has consequences, as we mentioned previously, in that um, uh, it may limit access to, to care of patients, um, but also that high volume centers are often seats of surgical training, and therefore shifting the workload to these high volume centers will have some effects on training that have not previously been evaluated. Our hypotheses were that there exists a case volume uh, outcome relationship in esophageal surgery and the current training program design and implementation is safe for patients. Again, we use the NIS. We um, got data on the fellowship programs from the various organisational websites um, and uh, also on general surgical residencies. Again, um, no uniform method of coding exists, which we'd previously um, published. Um, for example, even the leapfrog coding, which has been widely utilised across many institutions, recently changed their coding systems uh, completely between 2008 and 2009 without much fanfare, but really does affect the results and it hasn't really been um, uh, advertised in that way. Uh, again, we use the UHC, which often ignores uh, the, uh, a large proportion of esophage esophagectomies um, based on the reconstruction type. Um, and um, while CPT codes uh, do exist for each of the operations. The ICD-9 codes really haven't caught up, so it's sort of all lumped into one big group and makes analysis a little bit more challenging. Again, we use the same um, a complication uh, codes for risk stratification. We expanded our collection set just a little. Use the same type of statistical analyses. Um, this reports the nationwide esophagectomy volume, which really stays roughly the same. Um, from year to year, coming up with a data set of over 57,000 esophagectomies, making it a huge number for analysis. Um, we actually analysed the unweighted cohort of greater than 11,000 cases in the study period. Again, we've reported that um, mortality rates decreased. Different to bariatric surgery, though, the mean Charlson score, the mean Charlson comorbidity score decreased over the period as well. So it's difficult to determine if this is due to better perioperative care or perhaps just better patient selection. Again, we looked at the effect of each and every esophagectomy on outcomes um, using a linear um, logistic regression uh, model. And again, this is one of the most striking reports in the literature that <coughs> case volume really affects just about uh, every of the study complications in a positive manner um, and it's a very strong justification of the current um, paradigm of regionalization. To get further information on this, we actually expanded our analysis in this area 
to look at both the linear logistic regression, but also taking the quadratic when the linear regression was to, was um, significant. It's a bit complicated. It was explained to me by a statistician, but it's a valid way of um, of working out if at the high volumes um, this effect is still seen. And indeed, this will be the first time reported that it seems that there may possibly be an absolute limit uh, in how busy a service should be. Um, before they start getting uh, worsening outcomes. It looks like uh, outcomes and predicted mortality rates plateaus of between 2 and 3% um, at in the order of, say, 30 to 50 or 60 uh, annual esophagectomies, um, but it does seem to increase uh, after that. There's only a few hospitals. It's a small sample size. There could be many confounders, um, but it's an interesting concept nonetheless that has not previously been uh, uh, discussed. The effect of fellowship programs, there's various fellowship programs that are in, interested in esophagectomy. Um, you can see the effect. Um, just because a hospital has one of these programs doesn't mean they're the ones who are doing the cases. That is a limitation. Um, uh, probably more specifically applies to fellowship council fellowships than the others. Um, but it seems the fellowship training is safe in terms of mortality and, uh, and complication rate. But interestingly, there seems to be a reproducible and significant increase in an estimatic leak rate. Perhaps because the more junior person is doing the more difficult anastomosis um, at the fellowship level, um, um, as reported by Dr. Berkmeyer in this uh, in this forum a few weeks ago, um, just because there's a high complication, if it's detected early and treated early, it may be uh, may avert any um, long-term effects, and we're going to look at that further. Um, but again, a very interesting examination of the effect of training. Looking at any fellowship program, any of those three. Again, it's shown that anastomotic leak rates are increased in those institutions. Uh, total complications are, are down, um, but myocardial infarction and tracheostomy, which is probably a surrogate for prolonged ventilation and respiratory failure, are increased, which is very similar to what was seen in the bariatric surgical group. The effect of surgical residencies is actually a bit different to previous, uh, the previous paper we presented in that most things go down. Um, it's possible. Um, that there is more involvement of the attending in things like the anastomosis um, in hospitals that have more junior trainees. Again, this needs further, um, further work, but um, it does seem to validate the safety of performing an operation in these hospitals. So our conclusions were that the volume outcome relationship for esophagectomy has been proved in the current uh, training environment, again, without artificial categorization of hospitals, um, and, and for the first time, there seems to be the question raised of whether there could be an upper safety limit um, to, to this procedure. Surgical residencies uh, are safe um, with regards to esophagectomy, um, and in hospitals offering fellowship training may increase the risk of, of certain complications, such as an estimotic leak. So to summarise, really, the utility of administrative databases, and to perhaps get some excitement for them in that it is an easy way um, for people with minimal support to get some very good quality research happening, um, which is applicable to the real world. It can analyze a wide variety of outcomes. The strength of the findings are really based on the size of the data sets. Um, they've got widespread utilization and uptake of, um, of the guidelines and the recommendations, again, based on the size of the database. These are widely accepted. Um, they can be driving of, uh, of public policy. Um, and the uh, search criteria and the strategies that you use are easily applicable to multiple projects with a minimal amount of effort. So I encourage you all to consider using these. It's a very good way to get some good research with minimal effort. Thanks. Fascinating report. If outcome or influence by volume, is there a floor where you reach that uh, achievement of outcome? Or does it keep going up? In other words, if 100 cases gave you the best outcome, there's 200. Does it keep going up linear, or you reach the floor and then beyond that, you may be doing more cases, or as you imply, perhaps you can get in trouble if you do too much. So where does volume level off yeah. these two operations? The, the thought has always been that the, there's, there's a cutoff, and most of these have been arbitrary. And once you hit that cutoff, you're meant to be safe compared to other groups. And as you know, they're linked to remuneration and the like. Um, it really hasn't been proven for many procedures. It has for um, pancreatectomy, liver resection, and the like. Um, we think that it is possible that you can become too busy. 
Um, if, you're, if you're churning through too many things just to get your case volume up, it is possible that your care deteriorates. Perhaps if, I don't know, you're running 10 rooms at a time um, and counting that as 10 cases when indeed it's sort of one attending between them, whatever, um, th then that might uh, impact um, on the complications. And indeed, that's the first time anybody's actually reported a potential increase in complication rate uh, with an increase in case volume. The numbers are small, there's limitations, um, but it definitely warrants further investigation, which we're doing. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, that's a very nice presentation, and I'm glad you went through the <coughs> big pieces. I disagree a little bit with this being easy research, though, because uh, first, uh, there's a lot more databases, and one thing we do at the, the ACS Center is that uh, many of these cost quite a bit. Uh, getting the hospital discharge databases from the whole country, uh, especially the rural hospitals, uh, things like that. We do have to pay for them, and uh, that's why it's useful to work with the unit that has these contracts. And again, there are a number of free ones. A very good database in North Carolina, there's only one other state that even comes close, is, is the workforce database, because we have yearly access to all of the licensing data, including disciplinary actually. There's only one other state that has that, and uh, this has been going on a long time. It's a matter of trust. It's been worked out. But we, we provide that data, and they in turn let us see everything over there. And, uh, uh, that gives us a way to look at things that is much more precise than others. Uh, so you have to learn, as you pointed out, uh, what, the, what the discharge databases are around. There's work now just published that shows us uh, groups like the leapfrog that rely mainly on survey data, but those are really invalid <coughs> for those outcomes, especially morbidity and mortality. And so you have to see the value of what you're working with when you start. And uh, but, uh, I think it's an area that you can really do some important work in. Uh, it's obvious that you can in this, but it, it, it's just as complicated as the biochemistry. Uh, uh, finally, the, the College of Surgeons, we sent to this year to the outcome seminar that probably years on every year, so I think it's really quite useful for you to get you started. John Bergmaier is on our ACS board, uh, so uh, I recommend that to anybody who is going to get into this. So uh, congratulations, Bob. It was a really nice piece of work. Thank you very much, Dr. Sheldon. Um, just for the people in Wilmington, uh, Dr. Sheldon was talking about the fact that there are a lot of different databases, they're not all free, some are expensive, and it's often not that easy to actually do the, the data analysis, and I completely agree. One, one, oh, thanks for the comment. One of the, the, the major problems I had when I was starting was I just didn't know about these things. I didn't know what databases were out there. They're very difficult to find, um, and, and that's where the Shep Centre and the help that comes from being at UNC actually really, really is very beneficial and invaluable. Um, a lot of the biggest databases are, are government run and um, administered and are free. But some of the ones that look at specific problems, for example, when we want to get our pharmacy data, we have to go to the, some of the smaller and, and, and more um, specific databases and yeah, they, they cost. And that's one of the biggest problems is trying to find the money for them. Um, and it's very hard because we've, we've looked at a few and normally to ask anybody for any money, you have to come up with some pilot data. And it's very hard to get pilot data from a database if you don't have the database. Um, and, and that's sort of something we're working through at the moment. With regards to the ease or difficulty of, of uh, analysing it, um, in retrospect, it was, um, probably could have been easier than I've found it so far, um, because when I look at the statistics we've done, they're not that complicated, but getting to the stage of actually coming up with our statistics took a long, long time. Um, so I, I completely agree, it's not necessarily as easy as it looks, even if you did it backwards from now, it might be a whole lot easier. Um, and, and in that way, I think the modular um, construction um, that you can use in some of the, for example, the statistical programs such as SAS are, are generally applicable to a variety of different projects. Once you've got it, it becomes easier and easier each time. Thank you. Yeah. I enjoyed your talk immensely. Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Perhaps I can just bring one of the UK perspective on that by, by chance. So uh, I, I um, uh, happen to be uh, the trustee of uh, an organisation called National Confidential Inquiry into Patient Outcome and Death. Who are 21 years old this year for the confidential inquiry on the so called patients' deaths and their morbidity. Um, each year we publish the 
people to you know, sort of particular sort of fascination with this, uh, with this this topic. The other thing to say is our current president of the Royal College of Surgeons, Mr. John Black, uh, has for many years been teaching, uh, he's a, a, a not quite such an average for specialization as some of us are, has been teaching about what he calls the U-shaped curve on the uh, body outcome debate, which you have demonstrated very nicely uh, today with this objective is with that the tail going up with the uh, outcome being uh, perhaps worse if you're doing too much with uh, waters of, of that. The other thing in the United Kingdom at the current time we're going through is some of historically the revalidation, recertification debate. One of our three threats <coughs> of recertification in surgery will be individual uh, outcomes from surgeons. Um, now we all know as surgeons that our outcomes are very much dependent upon the institution of the multidisciplinary team in which we work. Mm. And I think you've, you've demonstrated that. I have great concerns and anxieties about that. I don't know whether you have any comments on that, which I, could, which I could take back. And finally, we're looking at our results, our individual results on, on funnel plots, which are very much like that chart we showed again, which is the body and outcome. Um, and looking for outliers within so many standard deviations. We look at those results <coughs> and continue to practice in those specialist areas. But the comments on the individual outcomes might be, might be of interest rather than institutional outcomes. Sure. Um, Thank you for your, your comments. Um, just briefly for Wilmington, it's talking about the UK experience um, in, in the area as well as um, wondering what the effect of the individual surgeon would be rather than the institution. Um, I appreciate the comments mainly as well. I've been looking very closely at the English data, which is excellent. The English data is a, a, a very good um, database. It's got a lot of information. It's got more information on the specialty of the person performing the operation. And it's in a, a country that has very strong um, centralization of certain services, such, such as a suffragectomy. Um, there's the, I think, the intercollegiate group over there, the Scottish guys have just come out with some very strong guidelines on centralization of a um, And I think that was based a few years earlier on, on something coming out of England as well. So it seems to be uh, strongly pushed there. And that's why the data is, is so good from that, that side of, um, um, of the Atlantic. Um, with regards to individual physician outcomes, the, the NIS, for example, does have a physician code, um, and you can track the physician within the year. The problem with the databases that I have access to is that that's not an accurate way of doing it. For example, if I was a single practitioner in a small private hospital um, doing a suffragectomies, I would have one single physician identifier. If I worked at UNC, and I was one of five people doing it, I would still have one single physician identifier. Um, and the case volume would be much higher for me, but it wouldn't really be one person doing it, it would be five. So we looked at the, um, the physician numbers and it sort of came up with the same data, but I, I didn't know how accurate it was, so we haven't published it. Um, a lot of places around the world, as you know, uh, are looking at detecting outliers. And the biggest question is, and where Nesquip and other organisations from the college here have become so important, is risk stratification. There's no, there's no point in working out who's doing worse unless you're, you're comparing apples and apples. Um, so risk stratification is big. The next step comes in identifying the, the outliers. And the last step is working out what to do about the outliers. Um, do, do they need retraining? Is there something intrinsically wrong? Do they need to stop doing it? Um, th those are questions that are sort of a bit beyond me. They're, they're difficult. Um, I'm, I'm sure um, uh, your group is probably struggling with some of those. I would think that a large proportion of the outcomes are, are, are going to be attributable to the surgeon, especially the technical outcomes at the time of operation, such as splenectomy rates and astomotic leak rates and the like. And I think that some of the outcomes, such as um, myocardial infarction, management of complications and consequences of complications, such as how many people die after an astomotic leak rate, how many myocardial infarcts happen on day three or four, I think they're probably going to be more related to institutional practices. I completely agree, and I think that's being more and more evidenced by the, 
the reproducible nature across different operations of the specific type of complications that are affected by, say, residencies or fellowships or case volume. It seems to be the same across different areas. Um, it's because the surgery is the same, the body is the same. Um, and, and I think that's probably one of, going to be one of the focuses of our research in the, in the year ahead. Thanks. I completely agree. The comment was about the limitations of the national data sets. Completely agree. We all know that the, in an ideal world, the best study is going to be a randomised, placebo-controlled, double-blinded trial. It's not going to happen in a suffragectomy. It's not going to happen in looking at um, tracheostomy rates in, in bariatric patients. So we have to go to the best available evidence. Um, for example, the Charleston score, it's a pretty well-validated uh, estimation of comorbidity. Um, the AHRQ comes up with um, some um, clinical disease severity scores as well. They're, they're all surrogates. They're not perfect. The, 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 there are lots of confounders. For example, looking at fellowship council effects on a suffragectomy. Not every fellowship council trainee does a suffragectomy. So that's a confounder. You can manipulate the data any way you want. Um, but if, if, you, if you present your methods, and you acknowledge the limitations, uh, at least early on, I think it generates a hypothesis. It's pilot data, and it's the best data out there. Um, so it's a good start, I think. For sure. The, the next step is really, uh, mainly from today, is to try and find out some of the other databases that are, are around, some of the more specific databases, and hopefully try and link some together. For example, outcomes of a suffragectomy have got to be dependent on, on, on stage and preoperative treatment to some extent. That's not included in, in the NIS, but it is included in the SEER database. That, that would be a very reasonable next step in that area. Um, with regards to bariatrics, the, the BOLD database um, or the, um, some of the other Centre of Excellence databases are collecting a lot of information um, and are probably stratified to or risk adjusted more specifically to the procedure being examined. Um, there are limitations of those as well. Um, but if lots of different methodologies come up with the same answer, I think that will give strength to the arguments, uh, even where randomised controlled trials are not possible. Thanks. To answer the first question about the applicability over of, of long-term longitudinal studies, you're completely right. Once they leave hospital, at least in the NIS, they're not able to be followed, but some of the other administrative databases can, especially the NHANES database. That's a very good longitudinal study over over 15 years, um, and, and there are others. Um, with regards to comparing processes of care, um, you're right in some respects, but I think that others uh, are, are easily able to be uh, compared. For example, treatment of achalasia in hospital perforation rates of pneumatic dilatation versus helomyotomy. Um, I think that is a process of care that's very easily able to be determined by a, um, a nationwide sample because of the numbers involved. I mean, that's one of the things we're looking at, um, or anastomotic leak rates and outcomes. I think anything that happens in hospital 
um, is pretty well coded for, and particularly mortality, length of stay, and costs of care are very well coded for in the NIS because it's a billing database and that's what they're focusing on. Um, I've forgotten your second question. The odds ratio. So the odds ratio of our case volume, I made a big point on talking about the fact that we did not arbitrarily um, allocate patients to different case volume groups. What we report in our odds ratio is the effect of a single esophagectomy. So increasing your, uh, your annual esophagectomy rate from 199 to 200 has an expected effect, which will obviously be very close to one because it's a very small number. I considered presenting the odds ratios of an increase of say 20 or 30, and that magnified the difference between the two. I just couldn't explain it very well uh, in, in ways that would differentiate the um, the fact that I was using a continuous assessment and not allocating to case volume groups and then sort of allocate to these groups that are a separate thing but it was difficult for me to explain. So the, the reason they're so close to one is because the incremental difference is very small. They are magnified. If you look at an increase of 50 esophagectomies per year, that does increase the, 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 um, the uh, odds ratio but it keeps the same p-value. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.